Welcome back to another Serial Killer Saturday. Today we explore the myth and legend of Countess Elizabeth Bathory. I've honestly been hesitant to do this one, as there is little evidence to corroborate the claims behind the legendary lady. So much so that you will not find her on Murderpedia, a very well-researched website I often refer to due to their well-researched information, therefore making the claims about her even more possibly completely false. Although new discoveries and documents have solidified quite a few of the claims. Countess Elizabeth Bathory born in 1560 at the family estate in Hungary. The family owned the town from the time of its ancestors in the late 1200s until the death of Gabor Bathory in 1613. Elizabeth's parents came from two separate branches of the Bathory clan. She had two brothers and two sisters. Elizabeth's mother belonged to the first group of high nobility who supported the Reformation in Hungary and was a generous benefactor, even founding a Protestant school. Mental illness may indeed have run in the family, particularly from inbreeding. But some of the alleged insanities, temper tantrums, sword play in the house, or an unusual allegiance to a particular chair were typical of aristocratic eccentricities. It is known that Elizabeth suffered seizures and fits of rage as a child. However, it is said that her father did as well. In later years, her letters described both eye and head pain that caused her problems, likely migraines and epilepsy. It is known that Elizabeth received an outstanding education. She was trained in the classics, mathematics, and could read and write in Hungarian, Greek, Latin, German, and even Slavic, the language of many of her servants. She wrote in the controlled style of one trained in the classics, including logic. Young Elizabeth was what we would call today a tomboy. She demanded to be treated as well as her male relatives and staff. She enjoyed dressing up like a boy, studying like a boy, and playing boys' games including fencing and horsemanship. It was typical for a young girl of the nobility to become engaged in childhood and then spend her adolescence at the estate of her future in-laws. In the year 1571, the then 11-year-old was engaged to 16-year-old Count Ferenc Narasti. The young count would go on to lead the armies of Hungary against Ottoman forces plaguing Central Europe at the time. Sometime before the conclusion of the marriage contract in December of 1572, she left her home to travel to Sarvar, the main residence and family seat of the Narasti family. There, she was entrusted to the care of her future mother-in-law. Over the course of her marriage, Elizabeth is estimated to have had five or six children, as some records are unclear to the relation of one and the birth of another. Elizabeth surrounded herself with an intimate cohort of servants in addition to Anna Darvoila, four others, an unusual mix of three old women and a disfigured boy, who would come to serve as her chief torturers and even execution squad. They would collectively torture and kill dozens of children, almost exclusively servant girls between the ages of 10 and 14. In their administrative and supervisory roles over the lady's staff of young seamstresses, washerwomen, and kitchen maids. Physically, the little girls were easy targets for old women and a boy to harass. 
All of the accomplices agreed that Anna Darvalia taught them how to torture and kill these children, and all agreed that Countess Bathory took a whip, cudgel, dagger, fire iron, needle, or cutting shears to them as well. One even stated that the Countess bit out pieces of flesh from the girls, but she also attacked them with knives and tortured them in various other ways, including biting the girls' faces and shoulders when she was indisposed and could not actually get off of bed to beat them. We also learn how she stuck needles under their fingernails before cutting off the digits of those who tried to remove the needles. While history has embroidered portions of the Countess's infamy, she was still, however, torturing and killing servant girls. After her husband's death in 1604, her reputation and standing could no longer see her through these misdeeds. The Turks were still at large, threatening her properties, and she no longer held any strings over emperor, crown, and church without him. Indeed, if the emperor raised an eye over her appearance at court while still in mourning, even more eyes would be raised. In the coming years, the countess made frequent trips back and forth to the royal treasury, each time demanding that the king repay the enormous debts owed to her deceased husband. Without his steady supply of plundered goods or ransom fees, Elizabeth's funding started to dry up quickly, and she was becoming desperate. The Countess began selling off items in an attempt to raise cash. The stress of being alone and vulnerable was catching up with the Countess, although until the end, she continued to play the Grand Dame. It does seem as though she suffered from a mental breakdown. Outside of the public eye, she no longer cared what happened, simply living for the moment, seeking to indulge herself in any way possible, and lashing out with a murderous rage when worried about money or imposed upon by outsiders or obligations. During this time, the tension at Sarvar began to mount uncontrollably. It appears that the Lady Widow now free of her husband's restraints, went on a killing spree. This time, however, without his protection, increasing pressure was put on her by both the pastorship as well as her son's tutor. Servants in her household would later testify that the death toll had now risen to nearly 200 murdered victims. Only God one former servant declared, knows an account of all her crimes. Although she had a right to spend the remainder of her life at Sarvar, Elizabeth essentially moved out around this time. With the exception of routine visits to inspect the various properties and winter holidays spent at Sarvar, she took up a nearly permanent residence now at her favorite country retreat, Castle Seta. By 1610, time was running out for Countess Bathory. Ironically, the man most responsible for whether she would live or die for her crimes was not the king or emperor, but rather her family confidant, Georgi Thurzo. When Thurzo finally rose to the status of Palatine in 1609, he became second in command to the king. By March of that year, anonymous complaints and rumors of the Countess torturing and killing, including the murder of noble girls, had reached both Thurzo and the king himself. Thurzo truly believed that Elizabeth's cousin, Gabor and Zygmunt were stirring up a dangerous form of trouble that would ultimately threaten the interests of Hungarian landlords and nobles like himself. Gabor, in fact, would soon declare war on the Habsburgs, 
and Elizabeth made it clear on more than one occasion that she supported her cousins against the king. That said, there was motivation on Thurzo's part, whether personally or as Palatine of Hungary, to curtail the power of the Bathory family in the interest of the nation. Under orders from the king delivered on December 27th, Thurzo set out from Bratislava on a two-day ride to Seta. He was accompanied by Elizabeth's son-in-law and an armed escort. He and his men arrived on the night of December 29th, 1610, prepared to apprehend Countess Bathory and her accomplices. As Thurzo's letter details, when his men entered Seta Manor that night, they found the bodies of dead or dying girls strewn about, all having suffered from torture, beaten, flogged, burned, and stabbed. Within a few hours, additional bodies and victims would be found within the castle itself. At least 30 known witnesses, townspeople, and servants of Thurzo arrived to take part in what was clearly a long-awaited spectacle. The manor house, located in town, was thoroughly searched, and then the countess was escorted up the hill to Seta Castle, accompanied by the crowd and a party of armed men. Her four accomplices were taken in chains for legal proceedings against them, while the countess was held in the castle. Back at Castle Seta, still under house arrest, the Countess embarked on a letter-writing campaign to free herself. She sought both the assistance of her relative Gabor Bathory, as well as the opportunity to put on the greatest performance of her life, namely, testifying on her own innocence. Thurzo repeatedly denied her petitions to appear on her own behalf. She, in turn, accused him of not defending her honor, at Thurzo's repeated urgings, the king finally conceded Countess Bathory would not be brought to public trial. Thurzo immediately brokered a clever deal. In light of the evidence, he recommended his original sentence of life imprisonment rather than the death penalty. By order of the parliament, the name of Elizabeth Bathory would never again be spoken in polite society. Stonemasons arrived shortly thereafter to carry out her final sentence. She was never to be let out of confinement. On the night of Sunday, August 21st, 1614, Countess Elizabeth Bathory was concerned about her poor circulation. She told her bodyguard, Look how cold my hands are. Her attendant told her it was nothing and that she should simply lie down. With that, she put her pillow under her legs. She was found dead the next morning. According to a servant of her son, Elizabeth was buried at the church in Sete on November 25th, 1614. Her remains were supposedly taken back to the Bathory family estate in 1617. Where she lies today, however, is something of a mystery. J. Brunecki reported that on July 7, 1938, the crypt at the Sete Church was opened, but the Countess's grave was not found. It is also claimed that in 1995, the Bathory family crypts were also opened. No remains of the Countess were found at the site. In Professor Kraft's new book, Infamous Lady, the true story of Countess Bathory, you will read the actual words of the Countess, as well as the people who knew her personally, her accomplices, certainly, but also her staff and attendants, the clergy, fellow nobles, townspeople, and even surviving victims. The link to the website for the book is in the description box and will reveal more about Bathory 
in their detailed book, so if you're looking for the truth behind the Bathory claims, I highly suggest checking it out. A small little disappointment for all the lovers of the legend of her creepy crimes. Elizabeth never bathed in the blood of her victims. This began from the legend nonetheless persisting in the popular imagination, perhaps, because of the Bathory's connection to Transylvania and vampire lore. Some versions of the story were told with the purpose of denouncing female vanity, while other versions aimed to entertain or thrill their audience. Many believe she was framed, as there were others ready to dethrone her and or take her property, including her son-in-law from her daughter when the Countess passed. She was so worried about this, in fact, that she rewrote her will, keeping him from doing such a thing. It is difficult to know exactly what happened, but thankfully, due to the interest in the case, many people still research it currently, and I'm sure as time goes on, we will find out much more. What do you think? As we've learned, money and power talks. And in this case, it seemed to protect her until other money wanted the power. I am convinced that there are probably more murderers back in this day and age than we will ever come to know or ever hear about, especially when it comes to royalty. If you have a serial killer you would like to see featured here, please contact me through any of my social media links or leave a comment here. See you next time.